If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. And, of course, the context is verse 1. It says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And we are down at verse 23 today. Verse 23. And it says, And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, Satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your book. We thank you, Lord, for um, the chance to be together today. And God, that once again, we can get together freely and nobody's worried about being here today. And, and God, we thank you, Lord. Uh, we look back at a couple years ago and um, Lord, we, we sure appreciate where we are today. And um, God bless this morning, bless everyone that's come. Lord, we've got a few visitors this morning. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'd bless everybody, whether they're a visitor or whether they're one of our regular folks, God. We pray that you would um, have a blessing for us this morning. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The blessing of Naphtali. You know, these, these blessings were pronouncements about the future of the various tribes. And uh, so Moses is about to pass off the scene, and he's, um, you know, pronouncing a blessing and making a forecast about the days ahead. But for Naphtali, he speaks of some blessings that were already theirs. In these other tribes, he's, he's looking to the future, looking to the future. Uh, and with Naphtali, he is also, but, but he mentions something with Naphtali that was already theirs. They were already satisfied. Look at it, verse 23. Oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord. They were already. They had something already. A guy said about that part of the, the world, he said, Naphtali, that the, the land that was given to that tribe, was invested with a territory which for sheer beauty is unsurpassed in all of Canaan. And it was watered from the hidden springs of Mount Hermon. They were given right off the get-go one of the most beautiful pieces of land in all of Canaan. Naphtali was starting in a good place. Boy, it's nice to start off in a good place. But you know, not everybody starts off in a good place. A lot of people, and I, I mean whether it be their physical life or whether it be their Christian life, a lot of people have a rough start. You look at the Apostle Paul, and um, Paul was very educated and very religious. But wow, he sure starts off the first part of his life I mean, it, it starts off rough. And when I mean rough, I don't mean unpleasant, but I mean he was rough. You know, uh, Stephen is stoned to death, and it says they laid their coats at a young man's, a young man, a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And, uh, man, you read the next chapter, too, that Saul was going around and raiding homes and persecuting Christians and hauling people off in chains and looking for an excuse to even go out into further places and do the same. Um, you know, Paul, as far as Christians, you know, would, would you have looked down from heaven and thought, now that'll make a great Christian. You really wouldn't have thought that. You know, and, and you know, of course, we know the story and we say, well, yes, pastor, we know that God chooses some of his jewels from the dark minds. Yeah, you do. But you know what? We look at people like him and we don't think that. Paul was rough. But what a change Jesus Christ made. He went from being rough to later on, he writes to Thessalonians and he says, you know how we were gentle among you. Boy, gentle was not a word in Paul's vocabulary before salvation. That didn't exist for him. He was rough. He started in a rough place. You think of that devil-possessed man in Gadara that the Lord came across the sea and uh, he met that guy, and he was in the tombs, and he was cutting himself, and he was crying, and people had bound him with chains, and he would break the chains. And he was a madman. He was godless. He was pagan. He was out of his mind. He was rough. 
He was rough. I wonder what his childhood was like. But, you know, he just he started in a rough place. Some people don't always have a rough start, but some people have a difficult start. You look at Daniel. The book of Daniel opens up, and he's in captivity, and he's a young man, probably 12 or 13 years old. His parents have been carried off in captivity and perhaps, and most likely, killed. And here's Daniel, and here's some of his young friends. And Daniel, at that young age, was stripped of love. You know, nobody, I, I know, I, I, you know, I'm speaking... I'm speaking in a Christian sense, in a godly sense. Um, you know, Daniel came from the people of God. And, you know, nobody's going to love you like your, your parents. And, um, and you're not going to feel security, even, even children that are abused. It is just the wildest thing. But children that are abused, they get in the courtroom, and when they realize that their parents are about to be stripped from them, they, they go into heartbreak mode because that's their sense of security. You know, how much more, Daniel? Daniel was stripped of love and security and everything, everything familiar. And on top of that, it looks like he was made a eunuch. I've read that story over and over and over again and never gave, given it a thought. This past week, um, uh, I wound up on the phone with somebody. Somebody had asked me a question. And, uh, you know, under the Old Testament law, it says, uh, you know, somebody that um, was like a eunuch, was not to enter into the congregation until the 10th generation. And man, right away, just for some reason, that clicked in my head. And I thought, wait a minute. You know, you got Daniel. You got the Ethiopian eunuch. You've got Abedmelech, the Ethiopian. Uh, you got some people, but especially Daniel. Daniel's an Israelite. And so I, I got looking into that. And um, the guy I talked to is sort of really knowledgeable about all that stuff. And he fired me off some information and uh, it answered my question, but in the footnotes, it told about what it meant and how they made a young man a eunuch. I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it last night. It gave me a whole new appreciation for Daniel. And well, Pastor, you know, why did God let this happen to me? You need to go talk to Daniel. I mean, he wasn't just stripped from his homeland. He had something done to him that you don't ever want done to you or your sons ever. He had a difficult start. Moses had a difficult start. You say, well, but he was raised in, uh, in, the, in the Pharaoh's household. Yeah, he was. Look at, keep your place there in Deuteronomy. But look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Boy, there's just a lot of comfort in the Word of God. Not everybody has the same start. You know, some people have good start, some people have a rough start, and some people have difficult start. But you know what? Uh, God, uh, God can take you wherever you start. And He can take you from the most awful start and take you to a great place. And our Lord delights to do that. Look at Acts chapter 7. And it makes this comment about Moses in Acts chapter 7. Look at verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. You know, um, we know that Moses' mom got that really unusual chance to, to raise him uh, for a few years until he was weaned, which if she stretched it out to the very lengthy as she could have, which they, they did in those lands. Um, you know, he was five or six years old. You know, I'm sure Moses' mama did all she could to influence him because she knew, she knew this was, this was unlimited. The door was only going to be open for a brief window. And I'm sure she made hay while the sun shined. But boy, there came that day. Six years old, and all of a sudden you're taken out of that environment. You're placed in an environment where you are never going to hear about the God of heaven again. And he went to the Egyptians' school, the best of the Egyptian schools. The Egyptians were known for their, you know, their multiple gods, and that's one of the reasons God sent the ten plagues on Israel. Each, each one of those plagues was actually aimed to make that particular god look foolish. 
And, um, but that was where Moses grew up. You know, that'd be a difficult place to start. Some people start with unusual favor. And you see that in our text with Naphtali. Naphtali is just getting started in the history of the Bible. And they start with unusual favor. You know, Timothy started with unusual favor. Yes, his father was a Greek, and we're really not told anything about him, but Paul writes to Timothy, and Paul rem- reminds Timothy about how blessed he was in his upbringing. He talks about the, the unfeigned faith, that real faith, nothing pretense about it, it was the real deal. And he said, Timothy, he said, I sure appreciate the faith that was in you. He said, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. He said, that faith was in your mother, and it was in your grandmother. He said, Timothy, you had a, you had a great start. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. You know, a lot of people, they, they really, um, they, sort of, they sort of talk themselves out sometimes of, of doing something for God because they say, well, you know, I, don't have, I, I wasn't raised with the advantages that so-and-so had. You know, I wasn't blessed with that family. I wasn't blessed with this or that or the other. In other words, what you're saying is you didn't have a great start. That's what you're saying. But you know, when you look at God's word, that really never matters. It just never matters. Look at Luke 1. Here's another guy who had a great start. Luke chapter 1. You know, we got a lot of kids in here, and I hope you kids, I hope you young kids in here, young people, you know, we got teens in here this morning. I hope you realize this is for you. You know, you're in this room, and yeah, your home may not be perfect, and I'm sure that if you could be honest, you know, you could tell, you know, it's like the little kid in Sunday school. Man, there are no secrets in Sunday school. Now, thank God I have no stories in recent history. So you guys are all safe at the moment. But I'll never forget being, being uh, hearing about one of the kids in the Sunday school class and, and a church we attended. And, and uh, she piped up right at the beginning. She said, my mommy kicked my daddy last night. And there were other stories that would come out about these perfect smiling Christians that came to church. You know, um, you young people in here, you know, you know, you think, well, well, my home's not perfect. And can I tell you, honest before God in heaven, there are good homes, but there are no perfect homes. They don't exist. You know why? Because at the helm, you have two sinners that are trying to live for Jesus, and they're still fighting their old nature. But you know what? If you're, if you're here this morning, you have Christian parents, you are off. To a good start. And God looks down and God says, I wonder what this teenager is going to do with this wonderful start that I have given them. And I'm telling you, you think God thinks that way? Oh, absolutely. To whom much is given, much shall be required. Some of you in the, some of you young people in this room, God has given you much. You don't, you don't really realize it. Look at John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the ordinances, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. That doesn't mean they were sinlessly perfect, but it means... They were walking so squeaky clean, it was hard to pin anything on them. And they weren't trying to, it wasn't a pretense. This was how they really lived. What a a wonderful thing to be born into that house. Look at verse 7. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without, that means outside, at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, 
Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Boy, they've been praying for this a long time. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. That's what's called a great start. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And boy, what a way to start. Look at verse 39. Look at verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 66. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Look at verse 80. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing to Israel. Boy, you know, any way you slice it, John the Baptist had an amazing start. What a start. And, you know, he was one of those guys that started good, and he just, man, he just stayed the course all the way. Some people start late. You know, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and Jesus looks at him and says, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? He said, he said, Jesus, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? He said, Jesus, I'm old. What are you talking about? And of course, Jesus goes through that chapter and he explains to them that new birth, which is the counterpart of the first birth and how it's a spiritual birth. And, and we find that famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was spoken to a man who was going to start. He's going to start late. But you find it. You find a few years later, he's at the grave of Jesus Christ, and he's with Joseph of Arimathea, and he's helping prepare Jesus' body for burial. And he was on board. He got started late. But thank God he started. And he was glad forever that he got started. And he's still glad he got started. He got started late. Jesus told a story in Matthew 20. And it was one of those stories where he was trying to illustrate a, a truth. And, and he said this guy went out early in the morning to the marketplace. And he needed help at his farm and at his vineyard. And he was going to hire some people. So he goes out about 6 in the morning. And he negotiates an agreement with a bunch of guys, and he hires them for the day. Well, there they really weren't enough workers, and, and uh, he was concerned about getting the job done. So this, this, this vineyard keeper goes back to the marketplace at about 9 o'clock, and he says, uh, oh, there's a few more guys standing around. He said, hey, would you like to work? He said, you come and work for me for the rest of the day, and whatever's right, that's what I'll give you. And then again, he went out at 9 o'clock, and then he went out at noon, and then he went out at 3 o'clock, and the Bible says, and he went out at the 11th hour. This, this, this is called a parable. Jesus would tell these stories to, to illustrate a truth. And the truth was that the guy that kept the vineyard is the Lord, and he was looking for workers. And he says, some start early. And some start at the middle of the day. And then he said, but at the 11th, Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in a day? So the 11th hour is going to be one hour of labor left. And he goes out into the market at the 11th hour, 
And he says, uh, you, you over there, you, if you guys, you're, you're just standing around. He said, you want to work? He said, I <laughs> not much time left, but, but I got some work. And he said, I'll, I'll pay you. Whatever is right, I'll give you. And at the 11th hour, they went to work. And at the end of the parable, these guys that started late, it was awful late. There wasn't much time to work, but they were willing to work, even for that short period. And they work. And the Lord Jesus is kind. And He's gracious. And He's a great giver. And money's not an issue with Him. And He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And though they started late, surprise, surprise, how He paid them at that 11th hour. Some people start late. You know, people that start late, they always look back and they, they mourn, they regret the years lost. But in the book of Joel, the Lord said, He is able to restore to you the years that the canker worm hath eaten. You know, the Lord is able to give you a lot more than you think, even if you're starting late. I mean, what he's going to pay you for that little bit of time that you got left, it'll be well worth your time. But it's not about how you start, really. It's about how you end. You know, Paul was concerned about his end. He said that I might finish my course with joy. Look at Luke 14 for a moment. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 14. Look at verse 28. Luke 14, verse 28. Luke 14, verse 28. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest I haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it. All that behold him begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, we, we all love the story of Samson. And, uh, you know, Samson was a great guy and he was the, the strong guy, you know, that just did all those exploits. And one of the comments you find that the Lord makes about Samson is in Judges 13, and it says, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan. Dan Samson started, man, he did some amazing exploits, but, um, you know, he's one of those guys that, that he just, man, that, that second half of his life was just an absolute train wreck. And yes, God lets him on the final day of his life, the Lord lets him bring down that temple of the Philistines and, and he is avenged of his two eyes for that. But, um, you know, Samson's one of those guys, he started well, but he didn't finish well. Paul talks about one of his co-workers and he was a young man named Demas. And you'll find at the end of some of Paul's letters, he mentions Demas and Demas is with him, and this guy's with him, and this guy's with him, and they're, they're going great guns. And then you find a little later on, at the end of one of Paul's letters, it says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, Demas started, but he didn't stay with it. He didn't finish. Um, Paul said in another place, forgetting those things which are behind. You know, um, Paul, um, he had to do something about his rough past and all that he had done. You know, Paul still remembered that. I'm sure a lot of people remembered Paul for, uh, for not very good reasons. But uh, you know what he said? He said, I've, I can't look back to where I started. He said, I've got to go forward. Got to go forward. Naphtali, in our text, starts off already blessed, full, full with the blessing of the Lord, and satisfied with favor. 
You know, the Lord in this chapter is pronouncing blessings on the tribes. But here you got Naphtali, and the Lord said, you're already full of blessings. And I've already poured out favor on you, favor with man and favor with God, and you're satisfied. And so the question is, where do you go from there? Where do you go? There's a song that's been sung here on a few occasions as a special song, and the chorus says, every need supplied, every moment satisfied. And of course, that's a reference to, you know, you and your walk with the Lord and how blessed you are to be saved and all the things God has done in your life. But um, where was Naphtali going to go from here? In verse 33, look at that verse again, uh, verse, uh, verse 23. Deuteronomy 33, verse 23. And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor. And full with the blessing of the Lord. Possess thou the west and the south. This was their blessing. It was an instruction. He he gave them an open door. This was the future blessing offered. He said, uh, Naphtali, he says, I know you've already got, you think you've already got everything you want. Man, you're just happy where you're at. And he says, but if you want more, I have more. You don't have to turn there, but in Joshua 13, by the time you reach Joshua 13, um, the Israelites have went into the land of Canaan and they've they've conquered the vast majority of it. There is no longer any huge united resistance against the children of Israel. God had said to them, go in and take the land of Canaan. And just a clean house in that place. And we know from the scriptures that it took about five years for them to do that. And so the Israelites themselves fought as a united group. The 12 tribes, they fought unitedly for about five years. And they had broken the back of all the resistance in the land of Canaan. And all of a sudden, it says in Joshua 13 that the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua, you are old and stricken in years. And there remaineth yet much land to be possessed. Israel had really accomplished the big goal. But the Lord said, yeah, you, you've really done, uh, you've done good. And uh, you've done a big piece of the job. But now there's more. There were places and things that they only knew about, they had heard about. You know, uh, in the Christian life, you know, there's things that you've, you know about and you've, you've heard about and you've read about. These guys had never been in some of these places. They had never lived there. They had never experienced it. There was yet much land to be possessed. And the Lord said, Naphtali, you're satisfied and you're blessed. He said, but ask for more. Go after more. This land that they were supposed to possess, it wasn't far away. And, you know, uh, this is this. There's some real blessings for you this morning, I don't know where you're at in the Christian life, but, you know, maybe you're not satisfied. Maybe you realize, oh, man, I got to work on this and I got to work on this. And but but maybe you're you're further down the road. Maybe there's some great blessings. You know, maybe you feel like you've really, uh, you know, you're past a lot of the battles that some of the rest of us are struggling with. And and and. Um, but, you know, there's still land to possess. The land that they were supposed to possess wasn't far away. And I, I want to say this. I'm talking about spiritual things. I'm not talking about something goofy. I'm not talking about some strange impression. You know, we're, ta- we're talking about, you know, possessing what God God has for you and going after more. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, sitting there and all of a sudden you just have this strange impression that, wow, I really should buy that that condo in Hawaii. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about some strange impression. We're not talking about something material, but rather we're talking about something that God 
has clearly spoken and uh, something that you're afraid of. You know what these guys, uh, what was going to stop these guys from finishing the job? And by the way, it stopped Naphtali for a time. Was um, they were afraid of what they were going to walk into. Um, the land that they were going to possess, it wasn't far away. He said, Naphtali, you're blessed. But he said, uh, he said, I want you to possess the land that's west of you and south of you. Whenever the Lord spoke to the children of Israel about this stuff, um, it was frightening because um, they were going to they were going to face some people they didn't want to face. They were going to face some issues they didn't want to face. There were battles that they really didn't want to fight. But a miracle was waiting for them. A miracle was waiting for them. And God had already ruled in their favor. God said, you know what? I'm, I've already been there. The Bible says long before this. God said about that land of Canaan, he said, mine eyes are on that land every day of the year. It's a land that I have blessed. And he said, it's for you. He said, I waited for 400 years for the inhabitants of that land to repent. And he says, they're not going to do it. He says, I've already decided this is the God of heaven. He said, it's yours now. God had already ruled in their favor. You can't go wrong. When God's already ruled in your favor. It was not out of their reach. You know, some people, they hear about something in the Bible and it happens all the time. You know, some guy, you know, he'll be preaching on something and and, uh, you know, and, and somebody will be sitting here and, and, and in their mind, they're thinking, well, you know, that's not for me. You know, um, that's not that's not really that's not in my reach. And the answer to that is, yes, it is within your reach. If God is standing there offering it to you, it's within your reach. If God is speaking to you, it's within your reach. If God has commanded you, it's within your reach. See, they were going up against enemies that were long entrenched in those pockets that they were going to go battle in. They were going into places that saw these Israelites as intruders, and the Israelites were intruders. And these these Canaanites, they were fighting for their homeland. I mean, it was going to be a brutal fight. You know, um, you know, in, in, in your spiritual life, in my spiritual life, there's things that are deeply entrenched in your life and mine. You know, you're sitting here this morning. If you've trusted Jesus Christ and him alone and you have turned to him, you're saved by the grace of God. I mean, he's washed your sins away and you've got that assurance of eternal life. And man, some great things have happened since you got saved. You've got the peace of God and you've got just a lot of new things in your life. And the question is, what about those things that, you know, God has spoken to you about and you've read them, you've read them. If you read your Bible, man, you're going to read some things and you're going to read them and you're going to go, I like this. I like this. And you're going, oh, I'm not sure I like that because this isn't me. And this doesn't fit my culture. And this doesn't fit where I'm at in 2024. And this doesn't fit the last 30 years of my life. And this isn't for me. And God says, yes, it is for you. If you want it, God says, I'll give it to you. You say, but God, the battle that's in front of me. And God says, oh, yeah, I know that. But God, that's deep rooted. God says, yeah, I know that. God says, I've already ruled in your favor. And if you'll wade into this. He said, a miracle is waiting. God's got a place for you. You know, we, you you know, God had this land for them. And it's interesting how our language still fits the Bible. You know, um, you know what we say? We say so-and-so is not in a good place. If that's you this morning, God has a place. And God's here this morning and he's saying, possess thou the West and the South. He says, I've got another place for you. I've got a better place. Do you not like where you're at? God says, I've got a better place. What did it mean for them to possess that land? Well, um, you remember when Joshua and the children of Israel, they, they really came to the first place where they crossed that line. And boy, a lot of times that's what it is. You just got to reach a place where you where you cross that line. 
You know, a lot of people, they just hang back. They can see that line and they're going, wow, I don't want to do that. I don't want to commit to that. I don't want to, you know, we got some guys in this room that do the street preaching thing. And uh, and they do it right, man. They go out and they're not calling people names and all that. They're just preaching the gospel and quote scripture and giving their testimony uh, literally out in the open there on the street. And, um, um, you know, you ought to try it sometime. You ought to try it sometime. Now, you ladies, I, I don't know about all that, but. But, you know, for a lot of people, it's just a matter of just speaking up and being a witness. And you know why? You got to cross the line. Um you know, I'll never forget the first time that that I preached on the street, and I have not done it in a long time. And um, but I'll never forget the first time I did it. I was terrified, and um, and I hate to be a spectacle. You know, like I'm 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 noisy here, and I'm not afraid of the pulpit, but but I do not like being a spectacle. My wife used to we we go into Walmart when my kids were small, and there'd be Mitzi and all the kids in the van, and I would run in, and I would come out, and she start honking the horn, and all the kids would start waving at me. And 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 I just wanted to hide, you know, and they just did that because they knew that I just hate to be a spectacle. And um, um, I'll never forget the first time I preached on the street. Did you know that's not a friendly place? And and maybe I, I realize there's the odd person that really likes being uh, a rascal and really likes being confrontational. But that is not me at all. And um, there was a bunch of young guys at the church we attended. We were all in our 20s and those guys were on fire for the Lord. And they said, Joe, we're, we're going to preach in downtown Chattanooga on Saturday about noon hour on, you know, high, uh, high noon. It'll be crazy on the street. Lots of foot traffic. They said, do you want to go? I said, sure. And so we went and and there were six or seven of them. And and. Um, and the way they would do it is they would uh, they would get at a certain corner and it was all legal. They get a certain corner. And um, when the light turned red, all especially at noon hour, all the business people on the street were stopped. And you had about a captive audience for about 45 seconds or so. And the first guy would stand up on the platform. There was, you know, one of those trees, you know, with the big concrete barrier around it. And he would stand up on the tree and he would lift up his his little New Testament. And um, and it was it was noisy on the street, even even though, you know, you still had traffic moving. And so you, you had to lift up your voice. And he would say, the Bible says for God so loved the world. And you got to do it slow, because if you're yelling and you're like a machine gun, they can't understand you. So you're doing it slow. And oftentimes people are people are hanging out across the street. and They want to hear. But this guy would go and he was some of these guys were really experienced. They did it all the time. And their their lungs and their voices were really built up to that. And so one guy would go 10 or 15 minutes and then he would look down. and He'd say, you know, you know, Bob, you're on deck, which meant you're next. And so then the next guy would do it and the next guy would do it. And finally, they looked at me and they said, Joe, you're on deck. I said, OK. My mouth was dry. I was I was terrified. I don't I don't I was terrified. So I grabbed my little New Testament and I stood up on that thing and and I climbed up and I went. And finally, one of the guys with a big smile on his face because he knew what I was going through, he said, you're going to do it or not. (laughs) And God is my witness. I said. The Bible says. And I started quoting some scripture. You know what I did in that moment? I crossed the line. Suddenly, I wasn't worried about whether anybody thought I was a fool because now they knew I was a fool. (laughs) I had gone too far to turn back. And in that moment, my fear was gone. You know what I had just done? I had claimed that land. The fear was passed. You know what some of you are doing today? You know, and, and, and I don't, that's an extreme example. You know, it might be, uh, you know, God wants you to be a witness to somebody. It might be God wants you to, you know, get something out of your house. He might want you to start a good habit. He might, there might be a letter you need to write. There might be something that you need to rethink in the way you, you know, I don't know what it is in your life, but a lot of times there's something there and it's long entrenched. And you know that you've got it about 80% on the ball. 
But there's still a piece of the Christian life that you're afraid of. And God said, God says today, he says, you know, you're blessed. This room in this room, I know we nobody has all the money they want and all that stuff. But you guys know we are blessed. You know, we are blessed. We are blessed off the chart. And we're never satisfied, but we are blessed. And you know what God says to us this morning? God says, are you blessed? And we would say, yes, Lord. And God says, I got more for you. He says, possess the West and the South. God says, you know, there's a piece of this thing you're afraid of. There's a piece of this thing you're afraid of the battle. You're afraid of what it's going to cost you. You're afraid of who it's going to cost you. You're afraid of something, but you know in your heart of hearts that I want you to do this. Would you possess it? God says, I've already ruled in your favor. And a miracle is waiting. Let's pray. Lord, help your people this morning. Lord, there may be somebody here that does not know you this morning, Lord. They have not deliberately called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and asked you to save them, Lord. They have not put their faith in you. Lord, they haven't done that. And, Lord, it's because they're afraid of what it's going to cost them and who it's going to cost them. But, Lord, you've already ruled in their favor. Lord, you've already granted them eternal life if they'll just come to you. Lord, you provided it through your son. Lord, would you please help them to know, oh, God, that this morning they can call on your name and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have that gift of eternal life. And, Lord, there's Christians here this morning, Lord, and, Lord, you know how we are. We all we all wrestle with things, Lord. There's always something. Lord, it'd be wonderful if this year, if this month, if this week, Lord, we would turn our view towards that thing that is wrong and it's been long entrenched in our life. And God, we take you up on your promise that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. And you will help us. God, would you help your people this morning? Lord, maybe you spoke to somebody today. Lord, if you did, they're sitting there and they're wrestling with it. They know exactly what it is. Lord, would you help them to know there is more, Lord? There's a blessing that is waiting for them. They need not be afraid of taking that next step for you. God, help them in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to him? Will you trust and obey? Boy, sometimes that's what it comes down to. You just got to haul off and trust him. Thank you. 
Lord, thank you, Father, for the good things that you have reserved for us. And that, Lord, help us that we would not miss those things, that we would take them because, God, you're holding them out to us, Lord. God, bless this day. And, Lord, what you have spoken, may it not be forgotten. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.